smoked salmon pizza oh here. Yeah, it's another one of the great appetizers. I've never actually had this, but I've heard about it over the oh. years. Holy crap. That's as good as I've always imagined it to be. And that little caviar on top is just. It's a little Hollywood touch. You know? It's a little Hollywood touch. Yeah. In Hollywood, restaurants are more than just places to eat. They're the location in which deals get made, inspiration is found, and ideas are born. Food is way more than fuel. A lot of business is done in restaurants, and I want an inside look. So I'm taking a power lunch with a big time agent to see where the deals get made, eating Jewish deli with an actor turned writer who found inspiration in an unlikely place, and ending it all with late night chili cheese fries and onion rings with the food stylist behind your favorite TV and film food moments. But as we all know, it starts with a power lunch. I'm making my way outside of the geographical boundaries of Hollywood in the Beverly Hills, where lunch is sport. I'm at Spago, Wolfgang Puck's seminal restaurant, which technically opened up in Hollywood in the early 80s. Welcome to Spago. Thank you. I'm sitting down for a power lunch with legendary Hollywood agent Mark Itkin. Are you are you based here, like in based Venice? Here. A 34 year veteran of William Morris Endeavor, Mark is responsible for shows like American Gladiators, The Real World, Deal or No Deal, and Celebrity Family Feud. So I see you got an iced tea here. Doing a work lunch, did people ever drink or is it is it iced tea and Arnold Palmer's and that kind of thing? I'm not a drinker, so I never drank. Okay. Uh, but there were people who did and it was great because sometimes they drink so much you could get anything you wanted out of them in a right. deal. If I can have a drink though, that'd be great. Sure. <laughs> so Mark, we're here at Spago. We're having a lunch. I grew up in LA and the idea of the power lunch it's always something that you heard about. It was this mythical thing. I want to know, is it actually a thing? It's actually a thing. It's that one level of lunch where something important needs to get accomplished, whether it's just building a relationship with a buyer, a client, uh, even a colleague, or it's where a really important deal needs to get made. Sometimes it needs to be a one-on-one, -on face-to-face, but I've had many power lunches where there's been four people, eight people, ten people, an entourage on both sides. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for hanging out, Mark. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I entered the business in the 80s, and that's when Wolfgang Puck opened the first Spago. It was quite the scene. I'd never experienced anything like that. What's your usual order? <laughs> it's funny because this is what I always order as an appetizer, the uh, tuna tartare cones. It's iconic, right? It's iconic. The cone, this bread that they have, I, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's one of the great taste treats in my life. <laughs> mm. What do you think? It's so good. It's everything I want to eat. One of the shows that you're famous for having a big hand in is, is American Gladiators. Yes. From what I understand, it was not the easiest sell. It took years, right? Five, took six years. years. Yeah, about six years. A guy from Youngstown, Ohio, named Johnny Ferraro, whose family owned a Gold's Gym in Youngstown, came to see me one day, and he sets on my desk this brochure, and it's two guys locked in an arm wrestle, and it says at the bottom, American Gladiators. And I just thought, what an amazing title. Six years later, and I think the 23rd or 24th buyer, the Sam and Golden Company, bought it. It was the first big series and the first big successful series I sold. At Smoked salmon pizza oh, here? Yeah, that's another one of the great wow. appetizers. <laughs> Holy crap. That Wolfgang Puck, man. I respect that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Wow. Look at this little fella. Harpenshire Ranch. Squab. It's fantastic. Eating like kings. 
having delicious food like this, can that be an icebreaker in a way? Yes. And it, it does create conversation because if you're taking someone to a place they've never been before, and you sometimes can share things too. So this is the Thai chicken salad. Fantastic. You've had this at a lot of power lunches over the years? Uh, not only have I eaten this salad at every power lunch, probably at every lunch I've ever had at this restaurant, power or non-power lunch. Amazing. Is this a power lunch that we're having? I think so. I'm I feel the, the famous I feel chef, the, man. I feel the power. <laughs> Squab here. Wow. The famous schnitzel. Yeah. My goodness. I've never had this either. This is a real treat for me today. That's so good. What is it that brings people to Hollywood? It's it's a, a great place to to fulfill dreams, but it's also a great place to have dreams shattered, you know? And I think if you're well anchored and you connect yourself to the right people and you have some degree of talent, you know, and passion for it, I just think that it's a place, it sounds so cliche, but it is a place where people can come and try to fulfill their dreams. Dessert time. Yay. This is the Yum. There's no sweeter closing to a power lunch than a milfoy at Spago. Never miss dessert here. As Mark and I shared our dessert, I felt like I just closed the biggest deal of my life. But really, I just had a three-hour lunch. Mark, I appreciate it. This is a dream of mine to have a power lunch with an actual power agent <laughs> here at Spago. Chris, pleasure's mine. Thank you so yeah. Much. I'm headed to Cantor's, a staple on Fairfax that's been serving up Jewish deli since 1931. From Guns N' Roses to President Obama to Mel Brooks, Cantor's is the most democratic restaurant in LA, appealing to all people. As soon as you walk in, one thing is clear. There's plenty of rugula and rye for everybody. I'm dining with Greg Sestero, co-star of the 2003 cult hit, The Room. Greg is Tommy Wiseau's creative partner and best friend, as well as author of The Disaster Artist, the book based off his experience making The Room, which was then adapted into an Academy Award-nominated film. Cantor's is the very place where Greg read the first script of The Room. So you and Tommy used to come in here all the time, right? Like... We used to come in here starting in 2000 when we were roommates. We'd always come in here late at night. We'd just kind of sit there and we'd talk about acting. We'd talk about the struggles of it. It's just one of these places you can kind of come and feel accepted. There's not a dress code. Or there's just the menu is kind of all over the place, which is, which is great. And if you're lucky, Bella will take your order. Hungry? Starving. I'm going to do the uh, egg white omelet with avocado on the side. I've been working at Canners for 53 years. I started out as a waitress. It was the hippie generation. I didn't think I'd be here for a year. What do you think? How about trying our soup? We have a really good uh, combination. It's called mishmash. Should we share a bowl of soup? Yeah, it's big enough for, for three. OK. Okay, Thank you. you when Tommy and I would come here, we'd walk in. By the time you got to your booth, that was kind of your your separate world that you were in. And what was your order when you came in? So it's bizarre, but we would always share food. I would get like a uh, like a quesadilla or something like that. Okay. Once in a while, you would mix in the liver, I guess the chicken, chicken I don't know. And it would, if we were lucky, it would end with a jello. I feel like Canners is among the sort of places in Hollywood where no questions are asked. You know, you can kind of come in and get whatever you Definitely. want. Let me get you started, okay? Because you guys look like you don't want to do anything. Thank you, Bella. I came to LA and tried to do things the traditional way. So I came here, I got an agent, and I would start getting sent out on these auditions, which I think really made Tommy curious, because I think he had tried to do the Hollywood thing. And I, it was weird, as I was always getting cast as like a French guy, because I could speak French. Oh, wow. And Tommy would always be like, why you get cast as French guy? You need to be American guy. <laughs> and I realized, like, I don't really fit into what this box is that people want. And Tommy obviously didn't fit into <laughs> any any box at all. Okay, you're the Hollywood guy, right? I am the Hollywood guy. Today I am. So one thing a lot of people talk about is the idea of the big break. It seems to me that your big break has been happening as a sort of ongoing wave over the past 20 years. It's survival. It's like every every actor comes here thinking, I'm gonna do that one movie that's gonna launch you. For me, like when I came here, the big thing was Dawson's Creek, those WB shows that everybody wanted to be in. I wanted to be in them. You know, at the time, I booked this movie, Retro Puppet Master. 
I mean, I was so out of it, I thought, hey, this is gonna be my stepping stone to play Anakin in the new Star Wars. So right as the time for me is I was like at the crossroads where I'd done modeling, and it was kind of time to be like, okay, you haven't acted in a long time. I get this phone call from an Entertainment Weekly reporter named Clark Collis, who had just come to see the room, and there's like 30 people in this theater throwing spoons at the screen, and he's like, I gotta write about this. And then that article comes out, and it's like six pages in Entertainment Weekly. It's got celebrity fans, it's being studied in universities. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm like, this is the break. But what a backwards way right. to do it. And it was just an incredible turnaround that all these years later, people were celebrating this story that really started in here. Oh my goodness. All right, let's do it. Wow. Yeah, now Amazing. we're talking. They were talking so much that the whipped cream was melting, so I just uh, livened it up a little bit. Jello with whipped cream, just like she said. Give it just a nibble. To bring back memories. Tommy would always be like, when in doubt, when I didn't want to have the jello, it's good for your hair. And I found out later he was right. Gelatin is good. No uh, way. Yeah. Greg's career trajectory is the ultimate and strangest Hollywood success story. From starring in a movie he thought no one would ever see to writing a book that was turned into an award-winning film, and to this day making new movies with Tommy, this is the promise of Hollywood everyone chases. LA is not really a late night city, so finding a good 24 hour spot is super key. There aren't that many options, and Mel's on the Sunset Strip is one of the best. I actually came here the morning after my prom, which was a total disaster. Most famously known as the drive-in from American Graffiti, Mel serves perfectly greasy diner food. I'm eating with Melissa McSorley, an incredibly talented food stylist. In Melissa's world, the food is the star. Spend all day at work making little pieces of food for actors to push around on the plate because you just don't look pretty eating on camera. <laughs> did you work today? I did work today. I worked quite a few projects today. A long day? A yeah. long day. I did a little bit of shopping, and then I ran off to a commercial where I made escarfo so that the actors didn't have to eat real snails on uh, camera. What's an escarfo? It's exactly like escargot, but instead of using snails, I use mushrooms. I feel like that would be an actual dish. Es escarfo. It should be. So what exactly is the role of a food stylist? So primarily the role of the food stylist is to make sure that the food performs on camera exactly the way it's scripted to. And by perform, it could be an exploding meatball, mm -hmm. or it could be the food could actually be a cockroach that they need to eat. So you need to make something that looks very realistic. So I heard that Freaks and Geeks is one of your, your first uh, jobs. Freak, Freaks and Geeks was one of my first jobs. It was a lot of school lunches. It was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, and cookies. And, and the thing that we had to worry about there that was so different was baggies were different in the 80s. So we had to look for flip top baggies and the little twist tie things. When I was working on Mad Men, they would say, oh, it's scripted that they're having a dinner, and the dinner might not be very specific. So keeping in mind food you've already shown, and then what was sort of in at the time, you would come up with a menu. Hey. hey. Whoa, nice. That looks really good. Thank you so much. Sure. So if this was what we needed for a scene, but let's say I didn't eat potatoes, do you, do you have a way that you, you could do this? If you were a vegan, we would just use vegan cheese uh -huh. and we would find a, a meat substitute. And if you didn't like potatoes, we could use jicama, we could use yucca, we, yeah. could, we could find something. We would find something. You worked on the movie Chef, right? Yes. Which is all about food. I was very, very fortunate to work on the movie Chef. And that is, that is probably the, the biggest vehicle for, for food to be a star that I've worked on. And under the guidance of Roy Choi, who was our technical advisor, Roy was very specific about you know how we made it, and we actually really made it the way he would if it was in his restaurant. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Would you say being a food stylist is part chef, artist, scientist, all these in one? Yes, I would definitely agree with that. I sort of laugh. I come from a, a fairly artistic family, and I'm the one I can't draw, I can't paint, but I can make anything out of food. So I, I found my medium. 
Okay, I'm gonna so drink cool. this. Shake. Yeah. This is I actually, didn't, this I didn't is want to like delicious. slurp this on camera. <laughs> it's delicious. I started the day with tuna cones and squab at Spago and ended it with mozzarella sticks and milkshakes at Mel's. From power lunching to power snacking, I've gotten to witness how food interacts with the world of Hollywood. I don't think I'll be an agent, a star, even a food stylist anytime soon, but I'd be stoked to dine with them any day of the week. Hey, 